This video will be a quick overview of the Java Collections framework. I'm assuming that you've seen some of this before. This won't be an exhaustive tutorial. We're just going to highlight the overall organization. And for today, we're not going to worry about how the collection classes are implemented under the hood. Um, instead, we're going to be purely focused on these classes from the user's perspective. For most of the rest of the semester, we'll flip that perspective and we'll think about how that functionality is provided, how those classes are actually coded. So let's take a look at this UML diagram that shows some of the main collection interfaces and classes. We have the interfaces listed here on the left. Above this line, these are all um, interfaces. And you should remember from 159 that an interface in Java is essentially just a list of method signatures with no implementations. A concrete class that implements an interface is responsible for, for providing completed versions of those methods. We've talked so far in this class about the notion of an abstract data type. And again, an abstract data type is the description of a type that specifies how we can interact with it from the outside, a set of operations that we can perform on it, but it leaves unspecified how that type is actually implemented, how it stores data internally. In Java, the notion of an abstract data type maps nicely to this interface language construct. And the Java Collections Framework provides a nice case study in how we can separate out the abstract data types, which are represented as interfaces, from the data structures that implement them, which are the concrete collection classes. We're not going to go over every element of this diagram in this video, but we'll quickly hit some of the key interfaces. Uh, let's start with the list interface here. Um, and if we click on this link, it will take us to the Java docs for that. Uh, and this says that an order that a list is an ordered collection where the user has precise control over where in the list each element is inserted. The user can access elements by their integer index position in the list and search for elements in the list. So I'm assuming that you have some familiarity working with lists, uh, probably by working with array lists in your previous Java programming in CS159. So we won't spend a lot of time on that. The next interface that I want to look at is the uh, set interface. This may be one that you haven't worked with in the past, but you should have some familiarity with the notion of sets from your um, discrete math course. So a set uh, is an interface that includes methods, or this set interface includes methods that are appropriate for collection with no duplicate elements and no inherent ordering among the elements. An element is either in the set or it isn't. And that differs from our list, where we had this notion of uh, an element being at position four or position five in the list. Sets don't have that same concept. You're either in the list or you aren't. Or I'm sorry, you're either in the set or you aren't. Um, where might this be useful in practice? So for example, let's say you're an internet service provider and you're trying to block access to malicious websites. You might maintain uh, a set of all of the known malicious sites. And then when each new access uh, comes along, it can be checked uh, for containment in that set. And in this case, we don't care about the order of the elements. Um, it doesn't matter uh, which element we're, we're matching against. It doesn't make sense to include the same site multiple times in our set. We just need to know if a particular URL is there or if it isn't. So that's an appropriate use of the set interface. I also want to quickly point out the Q interface. This may be one that you might not be familiar with. Um, and so typically when we talk about queues, we are referring to a first in, first out collection type. And the analogy here is with standing in line. Uh, in the US, we would say that you're standing in line. In the UK, they would say that you are in a queue. Um, in either case, we don't necessarily think of the people in the queue as being at numbered positions. It can be accessed arbitrarily. It doesn't matter if you're number seven in the line. Uh, the seventh person in the line probably won't get out or get in at the seventh position. You get in the queue at the back of the queue, and you exit the queue when you reach the front. Uh, first come, first serve. So 
Queues are used all the time in computing when we have one computational process that's producing data and another process that is consuming it. We can connect the two with a queue so that data isn't lost if the consumer falls behind or experiences a delay. So for example, we might have a web server and if a bunch of requests are coming in uh, faster than they can be processed, those requests can be stored in a queue so that the server can respond to all of them as quickly as possible in a first come first serve fashion. One other thing to notice here is that all of these uh, interfaces extend the collection interface. Um, so what is the collection interface and why does it exist? Uh, there are no direct implementations. So if you look at this uh, UML, you'll see that there are no concrete classes that implement the collection interface. Um, the methods in the collection class are sort of the um, only methods that make uh, a limited number of assumptions about, about the way the data is stored in the collection. So in particular, they make no assumptions about the ordering of the elements. You can do things like uh, add an element to a collection, but you can't, for example, request uh, an element at a particular position because collections, not all collections have that notion. So this sort of raises the question of what is the use of having this uh, collection interface if any concrete collection object is going to be uh, implementing some other more specific interface? So more concretely, why might we have a method that looks like this? Um, this method uh, named important operation takes a collection type object as the argument, um, in this case, a collection of strings, and it does something. Uh, we don't know exactly what it does with that collection. So any particular collection that comes along will actually be a list or a queue or a map. Um, so the advantage of coding things this way is the power of polymorphism, right? If this operation doesn't care about the type of collection it's being given, we can write this method once and it will operate on any collection type across that whole UML diagram that we saw in the previous, uh, in the previous slide. So that's where um, it might be useful to have this higher level, more abstract uh, collection interface. One other thing to notice. Is that um, collection itself extends iterable. So everything in this hierarchy is iterable, which just means that we are guaranteed to be able to loop over the elements of any of these collection types. And we'll take a closer look at how um, the iterable interface works and iteration works in the next video. So, so far, our whole discussion has been about the interfaces, which um, sort of correspond to our notion of an abstract data type. Of course, we also have the concrete uh, collection classes, and those are here at the bottom of our diagram. So you can see that there's typically more than one class for each interface. For example, we've already talked a bit about array list and linked list in this class. Um, and those represent two completely different ways of storing a sequence of items, and they're going to have different strengths and weaknesses. So array list and linked list. Uh, one of the learning objectives of this class is going to be able is going to be to get to the point where we're able to select appropriate collection types to solve particular problems. And that's going to involve both selecting the right abstract data type, so is this a problem that calls for a list or is it a problem that calls for a set? And also selecting the most efficient data structure for the problem at hand. So is this a case where the linked list structure or maybe an array-based structure will result in better performance? And so that's that kind of question is something that we'll be working on and building up throughout the semester. Finally, Let's take a look at the map interface. So put this on a separate UML diagram because map doesn't extend collection. Um, that's because maps aren't collections of individual objects in the way that all of the, of the classes in the previous diagram were. Maps instead store pairs of objects where one object can be used to access another one. 
So for example, we might have a map that maps from the from EIDs to names, so that if we know someone's JOU EID, we could use that to efficiently access their full name. And here's a boy code example that illustrates that concept. So here I've created a variable of type map. So that's the map interface. And this is a generic type and uh, different from what you might be familiar with working with, say, array lists. There are two type arguments provided here. And this is because uh, every entry in the map involves two values or two entities, both the key, the thing that we use for lookup, and the value, the thing that we're looking up. So this first uh, type parameter is indicating that the keys are going to be strings. The second type parameter is indicating that the values are also going to be strings. But these could be. Um, many different possible classes in Java. And we'll we'll get the uh, restrictions there later in the semester when we, when we study more about how maps are implemented. Um, so what does this example do? We're going to create a scanner object so that we can have the user type in an EID. And we are going to build up, in this case, a hash map. So the actual concrete uh, type that we're going to store in our variable is a hash map. Again, mapping from strings to strings. And the put method uh, takes two arguments. The first argument is the key. The second argument is the associated value. And so here we're putting in three key value pairs um, with three different faculty members from the computer science department. And then when this tiny little toy program executes, we'll print out enter an EID, we'll read in whatever the user types in, and then we'll call the get method to try to access the appropriate name based on the EID that was entered. So we could certainly run this. Uh, we get the output enter an EID. So if I enter Spragner, there we go. Nathan Sprague was accessed in the map. Uh, so that's how maps work. Um, again, we're going to have, uh, there are other names for this, depending on the, the language or the library that you're using. Sometimes they're called dictionaries. Sometimes they're called associative arrays. We'll generally refer to them as maps in Java and in this class. Um, there are two concrete implementations, two concrete uh, map classes showing up in this diagram, hash map and tree map. Again, as the course progresses, we'll get a much better understanding of how those differ. Very generally, hash maps tend to be a bit more efficient on average. Um, and tree maps have the property that they order the elements according to the keys. So if you iterate over the keys in the collection, you'll get them in some sort of natural ordering. 